Hello? Is that better? Okay. Uh, try and make myself audible because I'm late this morning. Um, so, yes. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your uh, morning of Open ACC. And no, I'm not going to continue. I'm not going there. Uh, this is mostly about the back end using uh, GCN as if it were an embedded target. Uh, the Open ACC stuff is basically the same as NVIDIA and at the same sort of level. So that's not really what's interesting about this at the moment. Um, the, uh, it's the, the adding the GCN back end is the part that I wish to present today. So. I'm going to start with a uh, architecture overview for those who don't know what it looks like. It's uh, I'm going to keep keep it brief. It's not the point is to sell you a GCN, but uh, it, the, hopefully the rest will make more sense once you know what it looks like. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the port started and how, and how long we've been working on it and what's going on. Um, it's uh, I don't know. Put it in context. Uh, tell you what's where we're at right now. Uh, then a couple of slides which I won't. Um, dwell on, but uh, for people who want to try it out, then there's a, it's kind of used it as a reference. And then most of it, most of the time, I intend to explain the trouble we had with the GCC internals, uh, trying to bend it to this target, how what's different about this target to other vector processors, and that kind of thing. I've got quite a lot of slides there, so we'll see how far we get. If we don't get to the end in the time, then we don't get to the end. But uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. So, let's get started. So, architecture first. It's, so surprise, for those of you who don't know, it's not a CPU, it's actually the GPU. It's the AMD GPU, not their CPU. Uh, it has, on each, of its, on each card, 64 identical compute units. Uh, each of those has four sub-processes within it, which are SIMD units, and each of those has quite a lot of registers. There's 800 scalar registers to play with, and 256 vector registers, each of which consist of 64 32-bit registers. So that's about 17,000 registers altogether if you were to treat them all as individual 32-bit ones. Uh, so uh, it's got quite a chunk of processing, in, and it's got that, for each compute unit, it's got that four times. So this is very different to a normal CPU. It, if you were to try and run it in single thread, threaded mode, it's not as performant as a CPU, but you multiply all that up, it gets a lot better. Uh, each SIMD unit, so four of these per compute unit, each SIMD unit can run up to 10 threads. Uh, MD calls them wavefronts. Think of them as hyperthreads, really. As far as I know, they run interleaved, uh, uh, sort of um, in the pipeline stalls and whatever with loads. and it, it, it's hard, They're hardware scheduled. You don't have to worry about it in software. Uh, so that means that with the four SIMD units, you can run up to 40 threads per compute unit, which means there's a total of 2,560 uh, active threads per, G, per GPU at any one time. That is, that is not to say they're all running in instruction because uh, the, the hyper-threading, but this is the number that the, CPU, that the GPU hardware will handle at once. Uh, and in, in um, GPU land, they like to talk about individual uh, vector lanes as being threads, which is very confusing for those of us who use a CPU land where it's you know, got a fairly clear meaning. Um, they also call them work items, which is a better idea. It does have, it is reasonable to call it that in a way because they do have individual hardware for each lane of each vector, so it, they are being processed in parallel. So that means that, in theory, there can be 160,000 like actual in, in individual calculations going on um, in the sort of you know uh, the, maybe they're not all, they're not all completing each cycle, but you know in 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 the pipeline at one time. Uh, you can't use all of those in, uh, all of those 17,000 registers in every thread though. You have to divide them between the running threads within each SIMD unit. So if you want, so uh, an individual thread, as in the, in the CPU sense, not the um, work item sense, uh, an individual wavefront can address in its instruction encoding up to 102 of 
the 800 SGPRs, and it can address all 256 vector registers, the VGPRs. Uh, so for maximum occupancy, if you want to have all 10 threads running at once in, in a SIMD unit, then you have to limit yourself to just 80 scalars and 24 um, uh, vector registers. Uh, you might think it would be 25 and a half um, registers, but uh, that's not the way the allocation worked out. It worked out as 24 vector registers. And you can't, it's not a dynamic thing. You have to declare in your object file headers in the, in the thing that the, the driver reads, you have to declare how many registers you intend to use. And it will not, and the hardware will not allow you to access registers outside of that set. It divides up the set per thread in a, at the hardware level. No, but different kernels can have different numbers. You can have, you can mix and match. You, you can't change dynamically. No. And this means, of course, that if you want to have your dynamic uh, standard library, um, you have, it ma have maximum occupation, then you need to build your multi libs and whatever using the minimum register set if you want to have maximum support, maximum number. Uh, at present, we don't do so. Uh, present, we, we only allow four, uh, one, one thread per SIMD, but that's just a limitation of the implementation. That's it's just a t on the to-do list. Um, it also, being a GPU, has complicated memory uh, because simple memory would be slow, presumably. Uh, the, whole, the GPU as a whole has a big chunk of memory where your games would normally store their textures and, and uh, I don't know, this and whatever else. And the, each, each compute unit has access to that via an L2 cache, which they all share. There's also 64K of memory on board, which is supposed to be really low latency, and all, they can all access it really fast. Uh, but obviously, it's only 64K. It's very limited use. It's, I guess you can use it for reductions and, and uh, various um, uh, memory storage, but you very quickly run out. Um, sort of gang level memory or storage. Uh, then each compute unit, so there were 64 of those on the, on the GPU, each compute unit has its own L1 cache, which accesses the L2 cache. It has 64K of another 64K of low latency, low latency uh, memory, so that's 64K per compute unit and 64K for the whole GPU uh, independently. And that has additional features that has, you can do atomic operations on that memory. You can, there's like, there's a, a, a store with atomic add and, you know, and an or and zor and all that sort of business. And you can do permutations and stuff with that memory. It's, um, it's got quite a lot of logic in it. It's not just a simple st uh, memory store. Uh, it also has a separate constant cache, which is used by certain uh, scalar instruction, uh, load instructions. And that's just there to make making a compiler hard. There's no other reason for it, as far as I can tell. It's just there to make, to, to give you cache coherency issues. That's the only reason for it. <laughs> I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there was another reason. Um, and on top of that, there are virtual address spaces. Uh, so you can, you can have, you can insert the LDS, the local data store memory, into the global address space if you put the proper prefix on it. And you can, um, and you can access the stack as if it's like every every thread sees it at the same address, or you can have it so that it's like a normal stack. You just have a, you just know where it is because of the pointer. You can choose different ways of doing it, and uh, that's again makes life complicated. But uh, I suppose it's there to make to give you more options when you're programming these things by hand. You can, you can wring all the power you want out of it that way. So if you're using the me virtual memory thing where they all have the same address, then no. But if you know what the mapping into real memory is, because threads live in the global G GPU memory, if you know what the real physical address is, then yes. And in our implementation, we, don't, we only use the physical address because uh, complicated reasons to do with the way that you can't trust pointers when they've got this other thing. Um, so. Yes, our threads do, they, reductions and stuff work by poking things into the other threads stack. This is the picture in the manual. 
Um, uh, it's, uh, I could have started there, but uh, it's a bit questionable. In particular, this, this puts the SGPRs outside of the SIMD thing, which makes no logical sense. It might be how it is on hardware, I can't tell. In the first version of the manual for GCN3, there was only one set of these. It looked like you had 800 to share uh, between all of them. And now in the Vega manual, the GCN5, they added these little extra um, layers. Uh, didn't really move it inside the SIMD, but I'm, 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 sure that I'm, I'm assured by AMD that this is nonsense. Um, uh, they, they really are 800 per SIMD unit. And um, so that you can see there's the GDS that's shared by all of them. Here's the LDS that's per compute unit. And we've got SIMD0 to SIMD3 um, with the dot dots, so there's four of them. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of extra details, of the complicated stuff about the L2 segmenting, but uh, that is not necessary. You don't need to know about that for programming it. Maybe for optimizing something at some point. So the GCN instruction set is a variable length encoding. Uh, all of the instructions have a 32-bit base. Some of them are basically 60, can be considered 64-bit. The second word is the second part is not optional, uh, which is so you've got this additional opcode-specific op encoding. But a lot, not all, but a lot of 32-bit instructions can take an additional 32 bits that have um, optional extra bar parts. So you've got to choose. You can't have more than one of them. You've got to choose one. But you can extend the um, the encoding with various with these modifiers. So you can have one, any one doesn't the encoding allows doesn't doesn't specify. But any one of your input, um, any one of your input operands can have a have a 32-bit immediate following the instruction. You can't have two of them do it, but any one of them can. Uh, or Alternatively, you can have a subword access modifier, which, in which you can say, I want to use the take the data from the bottom byte of the, this input and the third byte of that input, and I want to put it in the top byte of the output, and I want to negate that one, and I want to take the absolute of that one. And it's it's quite powerful, but it's difficult uh, to, to to implement in the compiler in a general way. But we can certainly use it for um, you know, 8-bit combined operations or something like that. Uh, but uh, at the moment, we uh, only really use it for a couple of specialist things. Um, yeah, there's also the 32-bit data, pro pro data parallel processing modifier, the DPP. And what that says is, say this, this, this register, but I want to use the vector lane one to the left or three to the left or something as the input. So that you can use this for reductions. You, you can use it to... Um, uh, m uh, add, add the left lane to the middle to the current lane and of the same same register, um, and then you you know you do this four times or six times or eight times or whatever, and you end up with you end up with your um, one value from from all, derived from all the lanes. So this, that's uh, and that's quite powerful. You can do all sorts of different rotations and um, and and uh, shifts and things to um, to, to to do cross cross lane arithmetic, it has separate instruction sets for scalar and vector operations. P you know this is a normal thing on CPUs, um, but if you're using the PTX or the HSA uh, G um, way of operating GPUs, the, the intermediate language that the, the, the shaders and stuff normally use, then you would normally only have vector instructions. You would expect all everything to be a vector, and scalars are just done. Um, redundantly, or you do it in one thread explicitly neutralizing the other ones or something. Neutering, I think, was Nathan's word for it. Um, this is, so on GCN, you have separate instruction sets, same as a CPU does, for accessing the, these, these different uh, register sets and for, uh, uh, and so you can, and, uh, so you can do a scalar add in the scalar register, or you can do a vector add in a vector register, and they're different instructions. And the, the, but the difficult thing is, unlike a CPU, where you have a full set of operations for the scalar registers, and you know, some of them for the vector registers, it's the other way around. We have a limited set on the scalar 
operators and the full set of everything is in the vectors. So there's just some things you just can't do uh, in the scalar register. You can't load a byte. You have to do that in a vector, in a ve vector operation. Uh, makes, makes the string processing functions interesting. Um, uh, the only the only thing that is scalar only is the control flow. So you want to do jumps and stuff that uses scalar registers for the addresses. You you, you don't jump to a vector of things. That's that's just not that doesn't make sense. The memory access is also interesting. It only has scatter gather instructions. There is one exception, which is the flat that scratch thing, which is meant to load vectors from the stack and has hidden magic, which does a contiguous memory load. But normally, you have to specify the address of every element you want to load. So you end up with a vector of addresses or a vector of offsets. Uh, it won't just do, here's a base address, load entire vector into registers, please. It's not an option. Um, and also, it has a whole plethora of instruction types. Buffer, DS, flat, global, atomic, scratch, scratch image. Uh, the list goes on, there's, there are more. Um, and they all have different uh, memories that they work with. The flat works with LDS, scra scra um, the scratch is another word for stack, really. The LDS, the scratch, and the main memory, but with the virtual mappings. The global only does global, but uses compat compatible um, pointers with the flat other for every other kind. Uh, as long as you're not trying to get to LDS. DS is exclusively for the, 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 the fast data stores and um, has the, uh, uh, the atomic operators as well go with it. But that uses a 32-bit address in a different address space to what Flat uses. It's a, it's a pain. The take, I mean, we're not going to go into all of that, but the, the takeaway is that we've got different size pointers and we've got different offset capabilities and we've got different um, magic uh, behavior for these things. The buffer uses a 128-bit descriptor that's got a thousand fields in it that controls a hundred different things. So you can do offsets and swizzles, and you can do strides, and you can change set what the data length is. And it does. This makes perfect sense if you're programming um, uh, manual assembly and you want to load your textures just so. But it's a little harder for a compiler to, to, to target. So, onto the history. There we go. Uh, this port was started uh, summer of 2016, about three weeks, I think, before the uh, cauldron that year, which didn't stop Hansa valiantly presenting it. And there he is. That's his picture from YouTube. I, I, doesn't, he, doesn't he look pleased with it? <laughs> Hello, Hansa. Uh, so, yes. And then about six months later or so, early 2017, uh, AMD officially hired us at Mentor to do exactly the same thing, but, you know, not in spare time. And so uh, they wanted they wanted specifically G Fortran to work. So I guess they have existing G Fortran code. They wanted it to work with OpenACC and OpenMP, um, uh, which is obviously a much bigger project than that which um, Hansa started on. Um, but we contacted him and Martin anyway and said, can we have your source code, please? Uh, it would have been rude not to, frankly, but uh, and it was a good start, so thank you very much. Uh, and then we got on with it, and we spent the next sort of six to nine months implementing um, much wider instruction set support, and we invented a, an ABI, because there isn't one for this target, and implemented function calls. Uh, we built a standard um, loader um, for simple programs, simple single-threaded programs, which, such as the test suite. Um, which is not a coincidence that a suite runs through this. That's the point of it. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it, uh, in, you know, so before that, you had to link your GCN binary into a bin in, 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 uh, into a sort of binary file and load it using a custom program which you wrote specifically for it and pass the data in in a specific way that you would you'd expect to find it. And uh, that was a bit hard work. This use this this takes a, a normal program which has main main function with, argu with string arguments and, uh, and, and, and translates and runs that on a GCN as if it were a normal embedded development board. 
Uh, we built out OpenMP, OpenACC, and libgomp support using x86.64 as the host. Uh, it's the only that, that's the one that has matching data sizes with the target, which is, I think, not a coincidence. Um, and switched it all over to use discrete GPUs, BG in, uh, to begin with, uh, as opposed to the Carrizo APUs, which use shared memory and are a bit different. And we um, configured libg Fortran to use the minimal mode, which, NV which was created for MVPTX. So um, that, that all worked quite nicely without, without too much effort. Uh, the hard part is what I'm going to tell you later, which is all the nitty gritty details. The, um, then in late 2017, uh, we released our first binary tool chain to AMD and their customers. Um, that was based on GC7, of course, and it had the Fortran working, it had the OpenACC and OpenMP working as in the GCC7 state, which is, you know, it, was, it worked. Um, that we didn't use any, we didn't use very much from the OpenACC branch. Uh, as little as we could get away, but I think we had some of the async stuff. Uh, but basically it was a GCC7 compiler with GCN support. The, then in spring this year, we extended that to support C and C++, uh, new, a new, um, new requirement from the customer and added GCN5 support, that's Vega processors. Uh, the C++ works when you parse it in the x86-64 compiler, LTO it through to the back, back end and compile it on the GCN, but we don't support exceptions, we don't support static constructors, we don't support um, uh, I forget what the other feature was, but basically you can't compile libgcc, libstud C++ for GCN yet, it, wor it will not like it. So C++ is technically supported, but only as an offload feature. And if you go to this massive long link, which you can find in the slides afterwards, I'm sure, you can go and download that binary to your toolchain now and the sources, and you can run it on your x86 Linux machine and try it out with the Rockham drivers. And, ah. Have fun. So the current port status is we um, updated everything to GC8 because the, for Spring release we're still using GC7. We incorporated all the OpenACC GC8 branch, so all of the stuff that's now being upstreamed um, is, is incorporated into our internal toolchain. We built out a lot more of the vector support. We have now have support for the fully masked loops proper scattergather, a um, whole load more of the operators, the vector operators. So the vectorization will, does a lot more stuff now and a whole bunch of big bug fixes and improvements and whatever and just general architectural changes. Uh, that's, so that's what, that's sort of, um, that's our internal state. Uh, oh, and uh, on the other tools besides GCC, there is no initials still. Uh, nobody wants to spend the time or probably money to do it, to, to, to create it. Um, we're busy enough on GCC. So we're still using the assembler and linker from LLVM, bugs and all. Um, but, you know, it works. So until we want to do it, advanced stuff, I know LTO or whatever, then uh, there's not a lot of um, motivation to go and spend the time and effort and money and whatever to, to get that fixed. One day. Uh, we also did a new lib port, um, so we needed, in order for OpenMP to work, we needed to have a working malloc. We needed, in order to do debug and whatever, we needed to have printf working because that's the one true debug, right? Uh, exit needs to work, otherwise your um, uh, your, your kernels are going to be running forever. Uh, abort because, you know, it's not perfect, it turns out. Uh, a whole bunch of other things like that. We have the new lib port running with dynamic, dynamic re-entry, which turns out to be important when you can run a th what was it 2,000 threads at once, uh, all of them trying to malloc stuff. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this, is, this, is, this new lib port is um, plenty enough for offloading kernels that maybe do a string copy or whatever. Um, and, it's, but, uh, and also, it runs the test suite nicely, which is good, which means that we can get we can figure out whether the back end is in good shape or not. 
so the upstreaming, I finally managed to get my stuff posted on Wednesday. I had been intending to get it posted before this, this event, so when, yay? <laughs> uh, there was just uh, distractions and holidays and, uh, and uh, a, couple of, a couple too many um, serious bugs got in the way, but um, I finally managed to get it done. This is a standalone only. I have not posted anything for the OpenACC middle end or LibGOMP stuff. Or, well, there wasn't much in the way of OpenMP stuff anyway, because that's pretty straightforward in the middle end, uh, for, this, for this purpose anyway. Uh, I haven't done, posted any of that yet, but that can follow later once the back end is working for bare machine purposes. And steering committee and patch reviewers uh, permitting. I would like to get this stuff into GCC 9, but we shall see how the times go. Well, that stuff, um, it'll, so, if I were to add my libgomp patches, then which probably could use some tidying up still, um, but those would um, enable the existing GCC 8 support to work. But what we have in our internal sources right now is highly dependent on the OpenACC branch. So until that's upstreamed, it's blocked anyway. Um, so basically, I mean, the people working on the PT export and all that are kind of blazing the trail for us through all the OpenACC stuff. Um, so the OpenACC is the bigger problem. OpenMP needs the libgomp implementation, and that's about it. Yeah, the plugin and the... Yeah, we have... Well, so the, the patches that I've posted, I did not deliberately remove OpenACC and OpenMP stuff from the GCN directory. Uh, they are in there, they're just inactive until we do the other. Uh, the, the lowering pass that I have that changes the built-in names, basically, that's all it does. Um, those, those are in, there, in, in the posted patches already. Um, there's not a lot you need to do for OpenMP because all it does is put everything into a struct, stick that in memory, and then pass it through. And uh, the, uh, that's fairly simple to do in the plugin. It, the OpenACC stuff is much more involved um, OpenMP reduction is here's a here's a, poke, poke the value into this struct and we're done. Open uh, ACC reduction requires LDS memory and all sorts of shenanigans and stuff. In theory, I guess OpenACC would end up being more performant because of it. OpenMP is easier on the back end. Uh, anyway, so yes, to do the subword vectors. So right now, my code supports 32-bit and 64-bit vectors. But I don't. I, I I have disabled 8-bit and 16-bit vectors because uh, basically they don't work properly. Um, the, the, the unlike most architectures, GCN has extra bits when you do an 8-bit vector. So you get an arm or a neon 8-bit um, vector. There are no extra. There is no. There is no ninth bit in that in, in the vector register. You, uh, overflow just magically does the right thing, whereas on GCN they always each lane is 32 bit, so I, we need to do some extra stuff to handle that. Um, and also, it tries to emit at the moment the, the way it is in the back end. It tries to emit an uh, an instruction with a U8 or an I8 suffix on the end, and there's no such thing. The assembler just barfs. Um But that's just that's just the that's that's my problem. That's not the GCCs. Um, the other thing we need, next thing to do is the register sharing to allow more than one thread per SIMD or four threads per compute unit. It's not that we can't do it. It's just I wanted to do it in a more intelligent way than just limit everything to 24 registers. Um, so I just never got around to doing it properly because it takes time and there's plenty of other bugs. So at the moment, we can only run one thread per SIMD and they have to access all the registers. Um, it's a, there's an ABI change in that as well, of course, um, for, the, for, the, for the library. Uh, there's a whole load of cleanups and optimizations need to get sorted. And the proper C++ support, we need to support exceptions and static destructors and uh, uh, whatever other features turn out to be missing from C++ support, it's a bit, bit harder. But we do see and we do Fortran, fine. 
So how to, I don't want to dwell on this because you, know, uh, you guys know how to build a tool chain, but basically you start with an LVM build, just um, extract the, the two binaries from it, uh, put, call, call them by the regular GNU names and put them in the proper place, and the rest of it will happen fine if you just do a regular cross build, GCC and new lib. Uh, don't, in, don't enable C++ and you'll be fine. I guess Ada and Go and stuff probably not good either. Um, then on the on the machine you want to run it on, you have to install the Rockham drivers. The kernel uh, has to be the correct one. Um, I, I think the latest Ubuntu one doesn't support the current drivers or something. But um, there's instructions on the Rockham website how to deal with that. Install the HSA runtime libraries in the standard place, and then you can just run a normal Hello World, whatever you choose, completely unmodified program that you could run on any embedded dev board, and it'll run on the GPU. That's you know, enough for the test suite. Not, not something that's particularly useful for uh, scientific modeling yet. Uh, same again with the OpenACC. You, uh, you have to build the tool chain but with the extra option. You have to um, Build the host toolchain with offloading enabled, but, and obviously using the, um, the, the, the the modified sources. And then the rest of it's the same, except that you don't need to have the loader because libgomp has a loader built in that can do all this correctly. Anyway, so GCC porting challenges or aspects of GCN that are challenging in GCC. <laughs> This is not really about what's hard in vectors. This is about what we, what, which bits of GCC bit back when we tried to implement GCN. Uh, what could be better in GCC? Uh, obviously, um, what we had to deal with is stuff that's of interest to this crowd rather than what's interesting about GCN in a way. I'm not dealing with OpenACC and OpenMP. There were, that was basically fairly straightforward, just implementation task. Um, I mean, I know Tom and uh, and Julian and that have spent some some agonizing hours trying to get reductions to work right across gangs and whatever, but it wasn't GCC that was causing the problem. It's just a difficult task. Uh, so the first thing we had to work out was the porting choice. Uh, how how are we going to do it? Um, so Honza had already started doing it one way, but did we want to do it that way? Uh, the existing GPU in GCC was, of course, MVPTX, but PTX is a different animal. PTX uh, assumes that you write a program for every work item, to use the AMD terminology. HSA is the same. It assumes that you, wrote, you write your program for every work item, and it's running, you, so it's the same program running many times in parallel. Um, and you have these fork, these virtual fork operators in your program, which tells you when your code is actually running redundantly and when it's not. And it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's the way you would do it for PTX, but is it the right way for GCN? Or you can model GCN as a CPU with a vector processing unit and just use SIMD instructions and the vectorizer and all that. And that was the way that Hunter started doing it, and that was the way we decided to continue. So basically, it is, op it is modeled as a normal CPU that does a normal thread that uses normal um, synchronization primitives across gangs and uh, has uh, and, and has a concept of, ve of vectors as a SIMD thing. So it's not just operating on a scalar that happens to be duplicated somebody else's thread, it's a proper proper vector of things. The next thing is the reload problem. Uh, so basically GCC has a rule that move instructions are not permitted to cause an additional reload because you end up with an infinite loop. Uh, you can have move, you can move instructions can do all sorts of things when they're omitted initially, but during reload or during LRA, which is what we actually use, um, they, uh, they're not permitted to, um, to generate additional instructions, basically, or have ad additional register dependencies. And GCC really wants to do that because 
we have this all this 64 lane vector and each lane has individual masking so it's a bit like if conversion per field and we want to be able to do this because we've got fully got support for fully masked loops and, and, uh, and whatever in the middle end and that means that the value of the exec register needs to be correct when the when a, when a vector instruction runs including a move um, whatever correct is is a, is a, is a question for, for uh, the, the code that's being generated, of course, but it needs to have the actual value that it wants in that register at the right time. And the easiest way to do that, you'd think, would be to have the register allocator do it, because that's what the register allocator does. It puts things in the right place where they need to be when the, instru when the instruction runs. But you've got this infinite loop problem. So we had to basically lie and say that this the move instructions don't have this additional dependency and then have an additional pass runs at MD reorg pass uh, to go through and insert extra exec fix ups to make them make put them all correct after the fact after reload's gone through and messed it all up so this took a lot of time to get right more time than it really should have done we went down the wrong path a few times <laughs> and uh, it was it was quite painful um, but eventually we've come up with some with the solution that works Uh, scalars in vector registers. This is a problem that was known about from the start. This is that problem, going back to that thing where you don't have a full set of operations available in the scalar instruction set, so you have to do some things in vector registers, and that means that you've now got these 64 lanes, which you only need one of, and how the hell do you handle that? So here's um, uh, Hunter explaining the original problem. Um, so. We must do some scalar operations using vector, oper vector instructions. And there are some scalar operations that we can use scalar instructions for or can use vector instructions for, um, and which is the best one, very much depends on register allocation. So uh, that, that's an extra, extra issue, which we still haven't fully solved. It's not optimal. It tends to do things on the wrong side and stuff. But this is something that. Uh, can bite you, and you end up with instructions that can go either way, and you don't know which it is until register allocation, and then you have to switch all your patterns over late to make them do the right thing. This was an interesting one. So uh, we had to choose uh, how to mask the lanes on this as well. Uh, you, uh, could, do you want to have only one lane enabled and have it run as a scalar operation with the other stuff all just dead, or do you want to have it run completely redundantly? So you want at A to B, but you might as well just do it redundantly across all your lanes, because why not? Um, that's what HTSA and PTX would do, because they don't know any different, right? Unless you explicitly say, if lane zero, then do this. Um, but then there's some things, like if you want to do an, an atomic increment, uh, and you've got 64 lanes enabled, then it'll, do, it'll increment 64, <laughs> and slowly. <laughs> um, so you've got, definitely got to get that right. So we ended up basically having up with coming up with a solution which the MD reorg pass goes through and looks at all this, and it, we do both. Um, so it, uh, it, it disab disables all except lane zero for loads and stores and things where it matters. And in other places, it might if it sees that lane zero is enabled, it might just leave it alone and just let it go. Uh, next challenge, uh, the vector size and the element size so I've already touched on this. They are a number of places, number of places in GCC that assume that a vector register has this many bits, and you can subdivide it this many times. So you can you can have like 16 bytes in this vector register, or you can have eight shorts, or you can have four ints, or you can have two doubles, no, well, yeah, doubles or longs. In this register, and you know you can that, that it's, it has the same number of bits no matter what. It's just the no, and the number of lanes varies with the num with the number of sorry the number of elements varies with the number of uh, with the size of the element. Um, and this is there's lots of places that just assume this is the case, and they try and they, they they think they can rebuild your vector type just knowing how many bits there are in it for you. 
and it's just not true on GCN. We have a fixed number of elements. There's always 64 uh, lanes on a vector. There's, there's hardware per, per lane to optimize this. It's not like it's going to subdivide it any other way. And therefore, the vector size varies according to the element size, not the number of lanes. So it, when we have a vector of longs, that uses two vector, two 32-bit vector registers side by side, same as you would on a scalar, um, many scalar architectures. And you end up with a vector size of 4,096 bits. If you use a single 32-bit uh, vector register to do a um, integer, integer vector, then you've got a register size of 2,048 bits. If you're doing it in bytes, you end up with a um, 512-bit vector, vector register. And there are all sorts of bits in the compiler that say, ah, oh, well, I've just seen a, um, a vector size of 512, 60, uh, 512 bits. It was, uh, 64, it was 64 bytes. I'm going to try and do, the, do integer um, uh, vectorization now, and uh, 512, oh, I know how many lanes that is. Oh, oh we haven't got one of those. Uh, oh, well, we can't vectorize this then. And this has been a real pain. Um, so we've had to do various middle end patches to make this go away. Uh, in particular, I disabled one of those features so that it just asks the back end for its vector every time. And it says, yes, I've got a, 60, I've got a V64 SI, I've got a V64 QI. Not that the QIs are enabled at the moment, but they were for a while. Uh, yes, extended RTL. So Onda suggested some in his presentation two years ago uh, for each lane and lane index uh, things that would make it easier to do. And, uh, you know, we looked at that and we thought this is nice, but ended up basically ignoring it. Uh, we just used what's already there for the moment. Um, didn't have to, we want, just want to get the back end done with, rather than optimize it at the moment. Uh, so. The specific problem that he was discussing in that slide that was in that presentation has been solved by using uh, scattergather loads of various kinds. Um, so in GCC 7, we had a mem that had a vector of addresses. We tried to update that to GCC 8, and it said no. Uh, because that's not a, you can't have a vector in a mem. Why would you want to do that? Um, uh, and then, so in GCC 8, we're using proper gather scatter operators, um, which are, expanded right from the start. And it has, it's not as good in some ways because GCC, if it knows it's dealing with contiguous memory, can do dead store elimination and stuff like that. With the gather, gather scatter, it's just on your own. So I don't know, maybe it'd be better to, to be able to do a, to do a proper contiguous load again. But on the other hand, then you end up having to generate your vector of registers every time. Anyway, so, but we get on with it. One thing we have done is we have changed the semantics of the vet select. It's documented to only have a constant, a constant in the vein se lane selector field. Um, and that was, well, there's an unnecessary restriction. GCN can do, can do it in a register. So, um, and sometimes that makes sense. Uh, so I just, just changed the documentation basically and moved a couple of um, asserts around. Um, but it's only a minor change. The um, extended RTL would be useful for the subred issue that we have, though. Um, try and get to that later, probably. Uh, oh yes, here's a good one. I do not have a solution for this. Anybody has any suggestions? It would be good. This function, this is taken from the Vex to saw test case. It, it's very simple. It just copies one, one um, vector to another vector, but it does so with a strided store. And uh, this, is, uh, this is something that we can totally vectorize. GCC can totally do this, no problem whatsoever. You just get a mask load um, instruction and a mask scatter store instruction, no problems whatsoever. You think, job done, great, except the test case fails. It does fail all the time. I think uh, it fails one time, in si it passes one time in 16. I think it's 16. Um, and the problem is that it's running one of, this, one of the things it's running this function with, it's passing in stride equals zero. And it would appear that most architectures do the right thing with this. Because, I mean, you look at this function, you can quite easily see that when stride equals zero, then it should be source, uh, I'm, um, 
it should be source n minus one equals goes into the bottom value, and uh, that's it. That should be what you do. And I've I've searched the internet. I've looked on the mailing list. I've never not seen anybody complain that this isn't true on other architectures. So uh, we, I assume that other architectures get this right, but. On GCN, what happens is that GCN tries to write all the values in the source vector into the um, destination uh, zero of the destination vector, ve vector, and there's presumably there's a race condition somewhere in the hardware or whatever. It's either it's do actually doing that many stores or it's uh, selecting a winner in some, op some hardware optimized way. Um, but whatever it is, it's random which one actually gets written. Uh, so I don't know how to fix this without basically just disabling scatter stores uh, because I don't know how you recognize this case uh, in general. Yeah? So for x86, uh, the architecture specifies the desired behavior. So on conflicts, it's left to right. Uh, in, uh, with, and, and if GCN specifies it as undefined, then I guess you need to version the, the loop and yeah. not vectorize it with when stride is zero at runtime. Or disable all the scatters. Yeah, which I don't want to do because most of the time they're a win, right? <laughs> so so, so I, I guess as x86 specifies it that way. And I guess power does so as well if they do have scatter stores meanwhile. Um, the middle end probably also has implicitly specified it that's what, that way, uh, which means you would even need some target hook to guard the, the versioning or so. By other compilers, do you mean other compilers for GCN or no, other, no. Or other GCCs? Other, compilers, other architectures. Other architectures, right. So okay. I don't see the I don't see the um, scatter store on on AVX or whatever it is that supports it, reporting okay. test failures on the G on the GTC on the GNU right. list. Right. Okay. So I was going to say the same thing as Richard. You need to. The yeah. proper solution here is clearly to clone the loop and invoke if it's not vectorizable because stride is zero. Call the non-vectorized yeah. case. Uh, I don't, yeah. So I don't know whether that's but a middle end thing that or would be a middle end thing. thing or what. But that would be yeah. That, I don't know if you have a pass for doing that, but that's clearly what ha the right solution. How easy it is, I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, it can be made correct, but it's, I don't know how you make it correct and fast. I don't know. But uh, th there is a, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the problem is you've got this I times stride um, thing. Uh, I, I guess you have to do it at runtime. You'd have to figure it out, wouldn't you? Whether. Uh, how do you test a vector of 64 DI mode? A V64 DI mode, how do you test that all the addresses in that are not the same? That's not what I'm saying to do. Yeah, I mean, but that's what you end up doing in the back end. In the, for this example here, you've clearly got, it's only vectorizable when stride is non-zero. Mm -hmm. So your vectorizer in the compiler has to generate code to yeah. is stride non-zero and, and generate two different instances of the loop. It's gonna ha I think like, it's going to have to be fixed in the vectorizer, you think? Yeah. yeah. And, and then obviously one of those gets crushed out to a single store, and the other one does the vectorized loop. But so you, still ha you still have this runtime check of is stride zero, but presumably this is clearly a noddy example here where the whole thing would be in line in some other bigger code. Where, you know. We also have the case where if you load, you can load a vector of offsets, uh, and then and there are some test cases that do this. And then use those to do a scatter store um, of another vector. Uh, and the back end supports this, you can do it. But in theory, you could when you load this um, when you load when you load this vector of offsets, two of the offsets could be the same. And then you get undefined behavior again. Um, yes. And if the obviously in the original C, it wasn't undefined. I don't know how you fix that one either. You probably need restrictions in the versions of C that you're actually coding to, because otherwise it's going to suck horribly in performance. Yeah. So um, I guess this is again why the regular CPU architectures have 
specified the architectural behavior in the way that it's the natural thing from that is in case of dependencies you get the the side effects evaluated left to right mm -hmm. uh, so it's 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 kind of a special case of the stride zero thing because if you have stride zero there's clearly a dependence issue and the dependence analysis phase of the vectorizer should have figured out well oh we can't vectorize it but apparently we get away with uh, doing strided stores because strided stores would be emitted in the correct order and the scatter ones are all defined to be architecturally in the way that we get away with it. Um, I, I may be misremembering, but the C++ standard committee is looking at high performance uh, algorithm, uh, performance like this. And my recollection on the wording for how a vectorized loop the way front of execution gets ahead would basically mean that the case where stride is zero would become undefined in mm -hmm. if, if that moves forwards into the standard um, and similarly yeah, in, yeah, in the kind of ga scatter gather th um, the case that you described where you got two pointers into the same location and different iterations of the loop right to the same location would similarly become undefined right, the same um, I know I, I, it, 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 it specifically, I don't know if it's in this, but I can't quite remember the syntax, the, the, the context of the discussion, but it was basically giving compilers more freedom to optimize. It, 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 when you put the compiler into vectorized mode, I think you, 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 it would be a new, some kind of new mode of compilation. But in that mode, it, you wouldn't have to explicitly mark the loops. It could just assume that this was true. For but any, I may be misremembering. For any loop you write using the old syntax that... I, I may be misremembering. It didn't have a new syntax, as I recall, but I can't quite remember it. There may have been a pragma involved, but again, I only saw this in passing. I'm just mentioning it as it may be something worth looking at um, on, to give a, to give input on. Yeah, yeah, well, with, with a new syntax or pragma or whatever, uh, I would completely understand it and it makes a lot of sense, but for backwards compatibility, just magically assume all the loops. Are uh, all if you want an older standard, you know how to select it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. Um, we've got a couple of minutes, so maybe get through one Do, more. Just a quick question about this example. Do I understand correctly that if we run the loop right to left and to zero, then all the compilers would give their own answer? If you were to reorder the iterations of this loop, it would have a different answer, yes. If you, but if you, right, if you compile it as written, then surely it's defined. No, I mean that the other vectorizing compilers would still put the last uh, source element in, into the destination, whereas without vectorization, it would have been the first element. Oh, if you explicitly coded the, if you explicitly coded the loop to go from n to zero. Yes. The compiler didn't reverse the loop. Then, I th does Richard's point about the correct element getting stored become in incorrect? So I, I think we don't yet do strided or, or scatter stores with a negative um, in, in negative direction because of this kind of issues. Well, we need a test case, so write a test case. I mean, maybe uh, so we, we would need to to kind of reverse the vector for for the scattering to get the architectural behavior in the correct direction. So we could work around this in the vectorizer. But I mean, if we now have the first architecture where this assumption does not hold, then we need to think about something else. I, I guess special casing the right zero case with either not vectorizing or doing something more clever even, um, isn't going to hurt x86-64 because nobody writes the code with stride zero. Anyway, I've run out of time. So I, I have, <laughs> <laughs> I have, um, a, this goes up to challenge 12. Um, so I, I, when I um, post, I'll post the um, slides afterwards and you can read them in your own time. But, um, yeah, there's um, the offset size and the mask mode, which somebody's already ag objected to on the list anyway. And uh, yeah, the subregs of vectors is interesting. How do you say I want the low part of 64 um, 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 integers, please? Uh, 
before register after register allocation you can just you know, you can just select the lower um, hard reg but how do you do it before uh, it means that we have to expand everything late which is obviously less less good um, split everything late I should say and then the VEC merge everywhere is a uh, a, ch a back end choice that um, we had to think about and I don't think we've ended up in the ideal place but the changing it now would be a big project because you'd break everything and then have to fix it all again. Um, so uh, this, anyway, some some reading material for those who wish to follow up later. Uh, it is now two o'clock, and I think someone else wants the room.